Let's come on over. Um, it's truly an honor to be here. Um, I think, Adil, you talked about the uh, pandemic. I think what uh, I'd like to say is that um, it's almost intimidating to be amongst a community of some of the smartest, most dedicated uh, people in Pakistan who form part of a community. I'm talking of the healthcare community, all the doctors, uh, all the healthcare professionals that we have from Karachi to Peshawar or to Chitral to everywhere else in the country, who have done an incredible, unbelievable job over the last 18, 20 months. Because we had no right to get through this pandemic in the way we have. And if we have, it's a credit to all those people who've worked way beyond their skin uh, to take us through wave after wave and come out stronger and more resilient on the other side. So, sir, credit to all of you and credit to all of your colleagues all over the country. As far as uh, universal health insurance is concerned, uh, it's been a fascinating journey. But to set the context, um, I think what makes it humbling is that Khyber Pakhtunkhwa is a small province. Um, it's one of the um, uh, smaller, more humbler parts of the federation that we call Pakistan, that we call home. And so for that place with limited resources, uh, right, with perhaps not as much exposure as a mega city such as Karachi, which we are all proud of, uh, to be represented over here to try and offer something to learn, for the rest of the country and perhaps for the rest of the world, I think is also a testament to the potential that we as a country have and what we can do. And I think that's why this story is important. Um, if we look at, okay, if we look at universal health coverage or what we call the Sehat Card Plus program, I think this is the biggest social sector intervention in the history of the country. We are covering almost 40 million people. In principle, everyone in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa who is a permanent resident can avail this. Seven and a half million families. Almost a million patient visits since the inception of the program. 500 plus hospitals countrywide. We typically tend to be limited by our ambition and imagination. This is one time where we have truly exceeded those barriers. It covers not everything, and that's sometimes a source of confusion, and you'll never get everything right, but it does cover most inpatient care. Uh, the way I think of it is simply it's critical care cover for everyone who's from the province in public and private hospitals across Pakistan. And it gives you, it gives ev anyone who's got a permanent address of Pukhtunkhwa on their ID card a million rupees of coverage and in some cases even more. For example, if um, you have to finance a kidney transplant or now liver transplant, right? For most inpatient care. You can see all of this and again, some intimidating words for me. But think not just of the poorest, but how much the shock of when a middle class, and in some cases I would even say an upper middle class family uh, needs to go through if they have severe disease that affects one of them. That's what this covers. And it's interesting that this is a program that has started from humble beginnings. And I researched a few of these dates 
uh, late last night trying to uh, prepare this. Yes, I prepared these slides myself. So excuse me if I'm a little bit red-eyed. Um, September 2016 was when the program kicked off. But it kicked off at a very limited scale. BIS beneficiaries in four districts of the province. And I think from there, the credit of how something that is truly game-changing really goes to the political leadership of the province and shows why if this country has to change, it has to change and it will change when decision makers own decision making. So within the next two years, I was, by the way, still in Dubai uh, in my previous career. Uh, the impact that it was having with a small section of the population in those four districts uh, meant that within the last cycle of government, it was expanded to BIS beneficiaries uh, across the entire province. So that's about 20% of 35 million people. Uh, originally, it had been planned to expand to about 50% of the population or what we call uh, people under BISP 32. But when we are actually looking at the costs that entailed of continually carrying out BISP surveys to see who's eligible, who's not, the question marks around the validity of data, not necessarily from a technical point of view, but from the recipient point of view. Because you think of someone who looks at someone else who's got a card and says, I'm roughly the same income level, why don't I have this facility, right? In 2019-20, we agreed on making this universal, and it took us a year to completely redo the process. If I have a little bit of time at the end, I'll shed a little bit more light on how this happened. But then, when we actually did this, and we had to really roll up our sleeves and get hands-on, between November 1 last year and February 1 this year, so literally 90 days, we covered all 40 million people. That, to me, one of the most inspiring things there is it shows us we can do big things in this country in a short amount of time. So I really want to take the rest of this presentation through a set of questions that's asked and shed light on this program um, from that perspective. Uh, because somehow in Pakistan, and perhaps it's true the world over, right, we almost always feel that if there's anything with a good story, it has to be too good to be true. And I'm not saying this is perfect, right? Nothing on earth is perfect. But I do think that every time I've been asked many of these questions, that there are answers. And there's clear answers, and I hope that I'll be able to convince you about some of them, because I think that we can build an entire health system around this and use a program like this to bridge many of the gaps or the failings that the vast, significantly funded, but under-resourced and challenged health system of Pakistan has. And the first question is really, is this really worth the money? Is there really any impact? Um, or is it just a political stunt? And I think a couple of numbers will give the answer. The average utilization of the program for the three highest years before universal rollout, so that's 16, 17, 17, 18, uh, and 19, 20, was 60,000 odd patients a year, so about 5,000 a month. Right. Post universal rollout, based on this year's average, so the financial year starting July. We're going to cater to over 600,000 patients a month. Put that into context, and that means in, within 12 months, one in 12 families in Pukhtunkhwa will benefit from this. Many of those in life-threatening or life-changing or life-and-death situations. That's the impact. That's the level of impact. We just had the most utilized month. So you see this chart of usage 
split into basically three segments. The gray bars show you the last four months of non-universal usage, when access was only given to about 25% of the population in all districts. And you can see that utilization was somewhere between five and 8,000 a month as we were ramping up. And you see a fair amount of volatility because of COVID and hospitals closing and opening. But in September, the month just ended, we've had 62,557 users, the highest ever. This raises, of course, a certain set of questions, but I think it also gives us a moment of pride that this is 62,000 lives impacted in just 30 days. That, for me, is impact at large scale. Impact is also, and we forget this, and I know that AKU plays a part in trying to make something like this happen as well. It's democratizing a healthcare. It's giving quality access to those that tend to be viewed by many as second-class citizens and deserving of only second-class facilities. But because of this, because it is for everyone, it allows high-impact treatment, it allows treatment in the right cities, it allows treatment in the best private hospitals to those in society who typically get a hard deal. And that's possible through the numbers. So you can see where this is being used the most cardiac interventions. And it's incredible for me the number of times that people have said uh, a family member had a heart attack but couldn't afford treatment because we couldn't give three or four lakh rupees. That pent-up demand is being serviced primarily in the best hospitals in Pohtunkhwa, but also 6% of the usage is happening in the rest of the country for people who would need to approach me or someone like me to tr try and break one line or another to simply get in front of a doctor. That, ladies and gentlemen, is impact. So the second question, and a valid one, is why universal, right? Should the rich not pay for this? And I think that on one dimension, the answer is yes. And I'm not going to bore you with figures here, but if you really look at it, the average um, GDP per capita in Pakistan is less than $1,500 a year. So just north of $100 a month. And that's um, 17,000 rupees a month. The income bracket that only really earns significantly greater than this say, 100,000 rupees a month or so, is less than 5% of the labor force, let's say 10% of the labor force, although I think that's an overestimation. And when you think of it, in this case, simplicity trumps complexity of process. The transaction cost of finding who the 5% are or the 10% are figuring out a way to leave them out, creating a whole process on who to leave in or leave out, versus accepting that health is a universal right and using something like this in its purest, simplest form to form the bedrock of a healthcare system, that was the vision over here. That's why we decided not to leave a single person out in the first phase. And I think that simplicity has been one of the bedrocks of success because it means we don't need to market. We don't need to give people awareness that we would have when only one in four people had it. You just know that if you have an ID card and it says Pohtunkhwa on it, you have coverage. And we've seen, and you can see from the utilization figures, that that simplicity has worked in terms of making everyone aware in one way or the other that they have this right. And so that's why I think sometimes 
we have to not over complexify uh, big transformational ideas but figure out how to implement them fast and that's what we managed to do over here so the third question and i'm sure there's people looking at that first slide and looking at that 60000 patients a month and saying this ain't sustainable right this can't continue to be funded but i tell you a couple of things i do wear my finance hat on and when i look at the way that we've traditionally spent billions of rupees over here trust me for a province like khyber pakhtunkhwa to spend 20 billion rupees today to give cover to 40 million people or even say 30 or 40 billion rupees in the future is not such a big deal there's many other things that are much more unsustainable than this and if you just go to give a little bit of a context to that 20 billion our healthcare budget is about 140 billion so 20 out of that is a sliver we already know that government in pakistan overall spends way less on healthcare than international benchmarks so if we add about 15% to our budget right to give this critical care that has a number of tremendous unintended positive consequences and that create a system that works i think it's worth it and when you actually look at it uh, as a percentage of our total budget it's 2 rupees for every 100 can we not spend 2 rupees out of 100 to give 40 million people the chance to have a better ability to survive when there's a moment of life and death that's all it is that is our job to figure out how to fund it but it's as simple as that if we can fund universities in every district without figuring out supply and demand right? if we can make large hospital after large hospital with billions with poor service delivery then why can't we spend 20 billion rupees in a province like pakhtunkhwa and the equal in punjab or sindh or anywhere else in the country right to really be one big element of transforming healthcare that's why i believe it is sustainable it has to be sustainable we have to make it sustainable and it is interesting of course that as usage goes up it doesn't necessarily mean cost goes up 10x we do try because we know we are the early adopters over here that we have to look at this uh, in a way that others following us may not need to so we look at costs being incurred on a weekly basis right and we seeing cycles but what is good is that whereas patient visits have increased 10x right cost isn't increasing by the same proportion so what we have to do here to ensure that this continues to be sustainable is to always be one or two steps ahead of the curve uh, and i can't promise you that because nothing in life is risk free but i can promise you that we certainly trying our best So one other criticism that's popular and again I think a valid question is but all this money is going to the private sector should we be funding the private sector right um why don't we give this money to public sector hospitals and fix them um there's a number of answers here we already fund the public sector hospitals and of course they get a portion of the pie but remember i talked about democratizing healthcare i'm sure most people in karachi given a choice at a critical point would use aku hospital as the hospital of preference or one of the hospitals of preference if we do that for ourselves why do we become intellectual when it's about the common man uh, more so i say it proudly the private sector accounts for 80% of activity and that's simply a fact of life that's how the private sector works it's open to all the hospitals that work under me and most of them are impaneled but i can tell you that private sector hospitals have a much longer line right because that's how the private sector works but i tell you what it's also doing 
this program is working as more of a healthcare regulator than our regulator is because the doorstops are sound. So when a private sector hospital comes and it's not up to the mark, you know they have to raise the standard. They know they have to raise the standard, right? And that's how it's working and that's what I meant by unintended consequences. And what you can see over here, I don't look at that green bar which looks at private sector spend and private sector utilization as money that's being diverted to the private sector. This is all the proportion of the population that could not access these hospitals that you and I could access, but we became intellectual and wanted to have a debate about the sector of the population that had to come to a government or hospital that may or may not have worked for them, that we are trying very, very hard to get to compete with the best of the private sector. But remember, as health minister, as a government, we don't own the public hospitals, we own the health of individuals, the health of our population. And that's why the ultimate answer is, we're not funding the private sector, we're funding health care for our citizens, wherever they want. So yes, we should be funding private sector hospitals as well as public sector hospitals because it's making them part of the public sector delivery net. And what quicker way to give people service to be able to do it in a day rather than to spend 5 billion rupees and 10 years to build a new hospital and still not have cracked the best way of working but what is also true and what I'm proud is that if you look at the top 15 hospitals that actually benefit from it, and this is data over the last three months, some of our best public sector hospitals are there in the top 15. You have the Peshawar Institute of Cardiology, which I'm incredibly proud of because this place has sprung up over the last year and it is within a year. With, By the way, many staff coming from AKU uh, being from KP and coming back and now offering a very high quality of service and inshallah within the next two years we're going to JCIA accredit this place and try and make sure it's the best in the country. We have some of our biggest general tertiary hospital HMC and LRH uh, and Irnam for cancer treatments and as you go down there are many many other public sector hospitals down the line and what this is actually doing is creating the competition and the dynamism that I believe will truly get our public sector hospitals to improve at a pace that they haven't yet. So then the next question, right, is there misuse? There must be billions and billions of rupees somehow going down the drain. And the answer is, yes, the program is not perfect. But I think there is an incredible team that has worked at this for five, six years. I'm not talking of myself. I'm talking of the people who've taken this from those four districts to now covering 40 million people. And they've been trying to make sure that we're always ahead of what's human instinct, of the one in 100 people or the two in 100 people trying to abuse or take advantage of a good thing. So... What I can say is very proudly for that team that there have been no major issues, that I ask them for data every month about the hospitals that they actually punish, uh, that there's stringent mechanisms in place. Yes, of course, there's the odd doctor that tries to take advantage. Yes, of course, there's the odd hospital that tries to take advantage. But by and large, this has been transparent, this has been robust, and we're trying to make it more so. This year, we, uh, this month, we will sign a new contract for continuous third-party monitoring to ensure that we learn and we're not thumping our own backs the whole time about how good this is. Um, what is true, though, is that if we waited for perfection, if we waited for a program that was completely risk-free, I promise you there would be no program. And so one of the key things in life, one of the key things in transformational change is 
you have to take some risk and try and mitigate that risk. And that's what we've tried to do, and I think kudos to the team that has done it so successfully. We are very proud of them. And so, winding up, what's next, right? I talked about sustainability. We have to make it more sustainable. Uh, the program has to evolve because everything good in life should evolve. And I think something that gives me immense pride, the same point I began with, is that something that began as a small program in Pukhtunkhwa that by the political leadership of one cycle of government, uh, they took a decision to expand it to the poor across the province, and then in the next cycle of government, uh, they decided, and I'm truly grateful for the leadership and support of the chief minister over here, and once the prime minister was on board, of course, there could be no better voice for the program than the prime minister himself. But it's gone way beyond Khyber Pukhtunkhwa now. So Punjab is now rolling out its program. And when Punjab, Islamabad, Gilgit Baldistan and Azad Jammu and Kashmir are on board, think of it. This time next year, inshallah, uh, Pakistan will be a country, and I believe Balochistan is doing the same, where at least 160 odd billion people will have critical health care cover. As the Prime Minister says himself, it's not just insurance, it's a channel to transforming the health care system. Because it's funneling money where public demand is. It's funneling money with much greater effectiveness and efficiency, right? towards medical institutions that the public have trust in, both private sector and public sector. It's creating economic activity. It's generating a whole new medical industry. It's going to have impact on the pharmaceutical industry. It's going to have impact on private sector investment in not just second tier th cities, but third tier and third tier and fourth tier cities in the country. And it's always going to spawn new opportunities. So one thing that we're working very hard on, and it's complex, but is a top-up program. Because I go back to, it is free for everyone, but now that we have an insurance industry, we can go further. So we're working with State Life to create a top-up program. And here's the opportunity. Just take civil servants in Khyber Pukhtunkhwa, right? Um, about 600,000 employed by the government. Each of them get a 2,000 rupee a month allowance for medical treatment. Now, is 2,000 rupees a month really going to cover anything when you need it? No, that's like a small allowance to raise your salary by 2,000 rupees. But a top-up program for those six lakh civil servants is already funded through the 2,000 rupees that we pay them. And if we manage to do that successfully, then you have the scale where you can open that up to private sector companies and private sector citizens, and voila, you have a transformation again. Right? So accuse us of many things, but don't accuse us of not thinking big. And then finally, I truly, genuinely believe this. We've got a phenomenal healthcare community We've got incredible doctors, nurses, paramedics who work out of their skin. But we also rightly have public anger at hospitals, at primary, secondary, tertiary facilities that don't always work. And I believe the solution of having a healthcare system at scale right, will have to have public sector hospitals that work in the traditional sense, incentives for the private sector to build hospitals where there's demand but no supply, and the ability for the two to meet in partnerships, uh, such as in places 
like Chitral, uh, Diai Khan, um, and it's possible, the, it's possible anyway because of the potential this country has, but it makes it easier when you have a program that can actually fund something like this. So we recently agreed to shift to a public-private partnership mode, 11 of our uh, least well-functioning um, public sector hospitals in the periphery. And we structured it for the hospitals to actually benefit from the Sayat card scheme and allow the cost that the hospitals would charge the government to be lesser than it would be otherwise. And for those 11 hospitals, in places that most of you have probably not even seen in pictures, we've got 66 bids from great institutions. And I think what that means to people living in the rural periphery, not an hour or two from Peshawar, but an hour or two from places like Dera Ismail Khan uh, or uh, Bhuni in Chitral, that's going to be truly transformational. Because I can tell you that when I went, for example, to South Waziristan and our partnership hospital there, I was amazed and proud to see that whereas in many of our big cities across Pakistan you have secondary hospitals that tend to not have specialists, in this mode you not only had staff from all over Pukhtunkhwa, but you had a gynecologist from Karachi who was serving the people in Waziristan uh, in a hospital that really worked and was something that we could all be proud of. And this is what I mean when I say health insurance is going to facilitate that make that easier. So it's only the beginning of the journey, but I think that's, it's a journey that can truly be transformational. Finally, I think there's lessons to be learned here. Uh, I think that too often we leave the thinking of how to transform our country uh, to those that um, don't have the direct ownership. I've worked on the other side as a development expert, as a uh, consultant, but when you're in the hot seat, you feel the pain of people differently. You can't help but feel it because they come to you. They come to your office every day with fear, with anger, with hostility at whenever the state doesn't work in the way it should. And if we're going to change that, there's no escape but for people like us to actually own the change, drive the change, and shape the change ourselves. And that's what we've tried to do with this program in Pukhtunkhwa. We've made our own agenda. Even more, it's not that big ideas can't work and we should be afraid of them, but that we all have to roll up our sleeves and pay attention to detail. And I promise you if we do all that, and I hope that to some extent, this proves it, and inshallah, we will try to continue to prove it. I think it proves in this case, but also in general, that if we really put our mind to it, we can achieve transformational results. Thank you very much. Uh, before we go on, I would just like you to see one small video, because I think if there's anyone that still thinks uh, or doubts the impact that this is having at a human scale, please do pay attention for the next 60 seconds. Thank you.